Hello, everybody. My name is Ben Sackerson, and I'm the president of Bruin Republicans. It is my pleasure to introduce Michael J. Knowles, who holds a BA in history from Yale University. He is the host of the Michael Knowles Show and the number one best-selling author of the thoroughly researched book, Reasons to Vote for Democrats, which has been endorsed by President Trump. Tonight, Michael Knowles' speech is titled, More Prejudice, Less Bigotry. Our goal for tonight is to create an environment where true intellectual diversity can flourish. In keeping with this goal, we will have a Q&A session after the speech. Thank you, and with that, Michael Knowles. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you to YAF for hosting. Thank you to UCLA for having me. It is such a pleasure to be here. Do you know what today is? Today is Ronald Reagan's birthday. Today is the 108th birthday of St. Ronald, the Blessed Gipper. What a wonder. Pour one out for Ronald Reagan. This is my first stop on the 2019 speaking tour, and so I would like to use this occasion to formally announce that I will be running for the Democrat nomination for president. I th thank you, thank you. I think it's pretty, ex it's definitely at least as exciting as Julian Castro running for the nomination. Figured I'm the only person left in America who isn't running, so perhaps I should throw my hat in. A lot of Democrats are running for president in 2020, and what differentiates these candidates is not their ideas. You would think a primary campaign, they would have different ideas, they would debate them. No, 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 no. They all basically have the same ideas. They want to raise taxes, soak the rich, overregulate the government, destroy the greatest healthcare system in the world, uh, destroy patient choice. They want to extend abortion rights now past the point of birth, what I have been referring to as fourth trimester abortion, somewhat radical. They want to, they just want the same old things on and on and on. Actually, there was one Democrat candidate for president who shared different ideas, who wanted to debate different things in the primary. His name is Howard Schultz and they kicked him out of the party. So now he has to run as an independent candidate. No disagreement in the primary campaign. That's not what it's for. Primaries were once about vetting ideas. Now they're not. What are they about? Instead, the 2020 race will be all about physical characteristics. It will be all about your race and your sex and your sexual activities or whatever you wanted. That's all it's going to be about. And this brings us to our topic tonight which is the bigotry of the present day left. You can consider all of the various campaign rollouts. We of course have Senator Spartacus, Cory Booker, the man who will never be president. Cory Booker announced his campaign with a video that talked about all of the awful racial oppression that he endured as a child. Never mind that Cory Booker grew up in a very nice area. Both of his parents were executives at IBM. He attended the finest universities on the Planet Earth, no, no, that real story would not earn Cory Booker any bonus points with the victimhood crowd. He can't admit it. He has to pretend that he's been oppressed. He has to pretend to be a victim. My mother washed more floors for less money than your mother did. That's what the campaign is going to be. Kamala Harris launched her campaign not on her impressive career as a prosecutor. No, no, no. She launched it on a mood, specifically a mood mix. She talked about all of her favorite songs. She said that she loved the song Young, Gifted, and Black by Aretha Franklin. She talked about how she went to an historically black college. She talked about that a lot. She talked about how she grew up in Oakland, tough and rumble city. Of course, she didn't actually grow up in Oakland. She grew up in Canada until she went to college. But never mind all that. She launched her campaign in Oakland. She did it on Martin Luther King Day. She... Also, talk, she talks about the rough and tumble upbringing. Her mother was a cancer researcher. Her father was a Stanford economics professor. Never let those facts get in the way, though. She's oppressed, darn it. She needs the mood of oppression. Her mother washed more floors for less money than your mother did. And then, of course, my favorite, Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> oh, Senator Liawatha got into a little bit of trouble yesterday, didn't she? Her campaign is so singularly focused on race that she launched her campaign by providing a pedigree. She launched her campaign with genetic test results. She, this would, she found out, she proved, 
sort of proved. She sort of proved that she is possibly one 1,024th Native American, and this, this alone, qualifies her to become President of the United States. She thought that was going to work. And of course, we find out yesterday, she's been saying this on the Texas State Bar, she said she's American Indian. Now she's got to apologize to all of the Cherokees, that's too bad. Her campaign is so obsessed with it. She didn't talk about her career in academia, her career at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. No, no, no. The fact that she might have had one bare little drop of Indian blood, the one drop rule, a bigoted rule from the 20th century, she's resurrected that. That is how the present day left is obsessed with racial identity. The bigotry of the present day left is breathtaking. Just this week, of course, we, this week is the key week for this, when you look down at Virginia, all you can possibly see is bigotry. You have, in case you've been out of Twitter for the last 72 hours or something, uh, the governor of Virginia, Governor Northam, uh, he apparently wore blackface in the 80s. He either, according to a yearbook photo of him, he either wore blackface in the 80s or a KKK uniform, which if it is the latter, he would certainly not be the first Democrat governor to wear a KKK <laughs> uniform, but it appears that he's the one wearing blackface. So Governor Northam wears blackface, and they, okay, they say he's going to get out of office now because he's unfit to lead. Turns out the lieutenant governor, Justin Fairfax, has now been accused of raping a girl. Cre credibly, actually, really, fair, credibly accused. I know that word has been abused in the last six months, but a credible allegation. So maybe he's out. Then you get down to the third guy who could possibly be the governor, the attorney general. Guess what happened? He also wore blackface in the 1980s. <laughs> Every single Democrat politician wore blackface in the 1980s. A party of rapists or racists in Virginia. Very, very sad. The entire line of succession. But I'm actually not talking about that kind of bigotry. I'm talking about Governor Northam's other bigotry, which is that he called for the killing of babies after they've been born. It's amazing. Blackface, a picture from the 80s, all of a sudden calls for him to resign. Not two days earlier, he suggested it was not fine just simply to kill a baby as it's being born, but the baby is born, it's lying there on the table, and at that point, the mother and father should talk to the doctors and decide if they want to kill it. That post-birth abortion. Now, that isn't even the worst part of it. It gets worse because Northam went on, he said, listen, the baby, maybe it's born with some deformities. You know, maybe it's born with some disabilities. And so, obviously, you should be able to kill it. This is the definition. The leftists have a term for this, which is called ableism. This is the definition of ableism. You say, because a baby has a deformity, we're going to kill it. That's perfectly fine. And this has happened for the left all across the world. Right now, the left in Iceland brags. They say that they have eradicated Down syndrome in Iceland. They haven't eradicated Down syndrome in Iceland. They have eradicated people with Down syndrome in Iceland. In Denmark, the number goes down just a little bit to 98% of people with Down syndrome are killed through abortion. The United Kingdom, 90%. France, 77 Even in the United States, 67% of people with Down syndrome are killed through abortion. This is bigotry. The left's bigotry takes subtler forms. Do you remember the... Uh, Covington Catholic High School kids. Maybe you don't, because the minute that the media got caught lying and that, they just shut it out. They just total blackout, no apologies. No, Those kids were, there was a group of Catholic kids. They were standing, waiting for their bus, and there was a short little video that went out, and instantly, the mainstream media, Democrat politicians, Democrat presidential candidates, Senator Liawatha herself, tried to paint these kids as bigots, as racists, as harassing this man. They're terrible. It's awful. They're, and do you know why they, because he was smirking. The kid, one of the kids, as some maniac was banging a drum in his face, one of the kids sort of smiled. He smir it was a hate smirk. It was an assault smirk. We need to ban all of the smirking. Then hours of additional footage came out. And what did it show? It showed that the kids had done Absolutely nothing wrong. Actually, what had happened was the kids were waiting there. A group of black supremacists started screaming slurs at them, calling them gay slurs, incest kids, crackers. And then some maniac Native American who lies about his military service runs up to one of the kids, starts banging a drum in the kid's face. The kid is actually pretty restrained here. Someone bangs a drum in my face. I'm probably going to do more than smirk at that person right in his face. 
And the, the Native American man's friend yells, go back to Europe, and the kids just stood there and took it. A lot of restraint. So what happened? When the mainstream media got it wrong, did they apologize? No, they no. Good guess. They did not apologize. Actually, they doubled down. The senior culture writer at BuzzFeed, uh, she wrote, quote, I have watched all of the videos. You can understand that the situation was more complex than the first video and still recognize why the sight of that face caused such a visceral reaction in so many. The sight of that face, what the little like nice kid smirking, half smirking, that face, what could that refer to? That can only refer to physical characteristics. She's talking about his face. She's saying that because he's white and a male, he is deserving of condemnation. That is pure bigotry. And you hear this specific example of bigotry all the time. You hear it in the everyday language of the left. You hear it in empty phrases such as white privilege or male privilege or check your privilege, all of the privileges. And what do they all amount to? They amount to two words, shut up. And they specifically mean shut up because of the way that you look. They imply that only people who look a certain way, people who possess certain genitals or certain gender identities, have the right to speak. They imply that the validity of one's opinion is sexually and racially determined, rather than determined by the truth value of the opinion itself. This is the leftist ideology of intersectionality, and intersectionality relies on this bigotry. According to intersectionality, there are systems of oppression. There are various categories of oppression, racial, gender, sexual, whatever. They all sort of feed up in a pyramid. Some are more oppressed than others. Then when you get to the top, when you get to the very tippy top, you find the most nefarious, villainous, monstrous demon in the history of the world, the straight white male. <laughs> oh, the horror, specifically, in particular, the straight white male who thinks that he's a male. Oh, if he thinks that he's a woman, goes a little bit <laughs> lower down on the hierarchy. This is the ideology that led this BuzzFeed writer to excuse the condemnation of innocent teenage boys based on race and sex. Surely you can understand why the sight of that face caused a visceral reaction in so many. And bigotry does not simply degrade the target of the bigotry. It degrades the bigot himself. It degrades everybody. You know, uh, my friend Andrew Clavin likes to point out that bigots are not necessarily wrong about the other guy. The trouble is they're just wrong about themselves. <laughs> so maybe the other guy is terrible, but we're all broken people. We're all imperfect. We all have foibles. And nowhere is this, I think the, the biggest issue is that you see this on is abortion. Have you ever seen this? You talk about the issue of abortion, and especially when men do it. They say, I, have this, I think it's bad to kill babies after they've been born. They say, shut up. How, da how dare you, a man, only women should be able to talk about abortion. They say, well, I, G Governor Blackface isn't a woman, and Governor Cuomo's not a woman, and I, I know a lot of... No, well, that, they're, they're, they're different. They're okay, because they support abortion. Well, what, okay, if it's only women, how about the 44% of women who are pro-life? No, well, no, they don't, they don't count either. You've got a, the system of oppression and the pyramid. And no, no, no. Say, so, okay... But even let's take them at their word. Let's say all women supported abortion, all men opposed abortion, which certainly is not the case. But let's say that that were true. How degrading is it to the woman to say that men have to shut up on that question? What does that mean? Is it because the woman can't possibly hold her own in a debate with a man? She couldn't, a woman couldn't possibly defend her own opinion. No, no. We need big daddy leftism to come in and silence our opponents because we're incapable of making our own arguments. How offensive to women. How Why else would they be so afraid of letting men talk? Bigotry cuts both ways. It degrades the bigot and it degrades the victim. English ought to be the official language of the United States. People who... <laughs> you bigots, you... No, I'm joking. People who come to this country should learn English. And, and yet, we all agree with that. The left would say that those opinions are bigoted. How are they bigoted? You've heard it before. They say, how dare you say that? How dare you complain about people who don't speak the language of this country coming to this country? That, to call that statement bigoted is itself bigoted. Because what is the implication? The implication of this is that someone who comes to this country, 
couldn't possibly learn English. Oh, how could they? Those people, they're so unintelligent. They're so lazy. How could we ever expect them to be as advanced as we are? We, we people who speak English. When it gets to the question of illegal aliens, we're talking about people who have come to this country traveling sometimes on foot, sometimes hundreds, if not thousands of miles. And then the left tells us, well, those people could never be expected to learn English. Them? What have they ever done? What are they capable of doing? What could be more bigoted? than the leftist suggestion that those people are simply inferior. It is what Michael Gerson once called the soft bigotry of low expectations. People, by the way, I should stop here for a second. People are very confused about what bigotry means. Be and it's because the left has so abused language that now everything is considered bigoted. You probably, you, have you, I was reading, I was Googling this you know, before the talk. Apparently, the OK sign, you know this? This is bigoted now, did you know that? The OK sign. The OK sign, which has been around since the 5th century BC. <laughs> it's been around longer than white people. I don't... The OK sign. Statues in Thailand of Buddha doing this sign. Yeah, apparently Buddha was a white supremacist. <laughs> there in uh, Naples, in Greece, in the Mediterranean region, this, uh, this is a sign of matrimony, justice, love, and apparently white supremacy. I, and I don't know, I'm from a Southern Italian family, very debatable as to whether those guys are white. I don't, I don't know if they would agree. And then of course, the, the one that shocked me the most is Stephen Curry. Stephen Curry, six-time NBA All-Star, three-time NBA champion, not like the whitest guy in the world, he goes and sinks a three-pointer. The biggest white supremacist of them all, more so than Buddha. Outrageous. Not just the OK sign, though. It turns out milk also very, very bigoted. Milk is, uh-huh. Oh, yeah, 1%, 2% heavy cream, all of it very bigoted. The Huffington Post published an article, quote, the troubling link between milk and racism. PETA, PETA, the uh, people for eating tasty animals, or so, no, 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 that's, no. The, the people for the ethical treatment of animals, they sent out a press release. They said, yes, yes, that's right. Milk is racist. Stop drinking milk. This, I can't believe that. I can't quite get behind that. Bigotry, what bigotry really is, is an extreme and obstinate narrow-mindedness. In the older sense of the word, the, it also connotes a certain religious hypocrisy and superstition. And if the milk and the OK sign are any indication, it still has a lot of superstition with it. But bigotry is not just limited to physical traits. It also includes ideological questions. Now, this is not to say that if you think one religion is correct and another is wrong, that makes you a bigot. Or if you think one political system is better than another, that that's bigotry. Or that uh, one economic system is better than another. No. But to dismiss an idea out of hand, to angrily not even consider entertaining the thought, that is what bigotry is. You see an example of this at Grand Canyon University. It's just, it turns out Grand Canyon University just invited my pal Ben, uh, disinvited rather, my pal Ben Shapiro from speaking. And I'm very offended by this because they allowed me to speak on campus, <laughs> which means that to them, I am apparently more acceptable to the left than Ben Shapiro. I wrote a blank book called Reasons to Vote for Democrats, a comprehensive guide. They will allow me to speak there, but not Ben. What do I have to do to get disinvited from a campus? They, they said of their decision, quote, our decision to cancel Shapiro's speaking engagement is not a reflection of his ideologies, <laughs> wink, or the values he represents, but rather a desire to focus our opportunities, uh, a focus on opportunities that bring people together. So, <laughs> so the university is going to bring people together by banning them from campus. They're going to unite America by silencing half of America. And it's not just colleges. This is happening at high schools as well. There's a national news story right now about a teacher in New York. A teacher is the lone open conservative at his high school. He showed a documentary uh, from Fox News, produced by Fox News, that was his big sin, about uh, due process on college campuses as part of a bigger lesson. The superintendent of that school is now trying to have him fired, a 30-year teacher, the first time he ever even sort of tipped his hand about his politics. How do I know this? because that man was my teacher. Coincidentally, I was in that class. And that superintendent, by the way, his name's Christopher Mano, when he was at a different school in New Jersey in 2009, he encouraged elementary school students to sing odes to Barack Obama. That was okay. Singing odes to Barack Obama, that's just good education. But showing a documentary about due process, that's, 
politics. You got to get that out of the classroom. That is pure bigotry. And the effect of that bigotry is hollowing out our educational system. And it's imbuing that bigotry in a whole new generation. Bigotry crops up everywhere. It crops up on the left, it crops up on the right, it's in the center, it's all over the place. Why? Because human beings are imperfect. The imagination of man's heart is evil from the beginning. It's going to happen everywhere. Sure, I agree. However, today, the vast majority of bigotry, racial, sexual, ideological, occurs on the left. What are we to do about this? They offer us some platitudes. They say, well, you know, man, <coughs> uh, acceptance, you know, I mean, <coughs> tolerance, you know, multiculturalism. What do those platitudes do for us? They do nothing but double down on the problem. They substitute other ideologies for this current one. What are we to do? They say multiculturalism. Well, how do we treat someone who suggests cultural assimilation? You'd have to throw them out. We'd be right back to where we begin. The only way to combat bigotry is prejudice. This is another word that people don't understand because it's been totally abused in the English language. People think that bigotry and prejudice are the same thing. They're not. Bigotry is an extreme narrow-mindedness. Prejudice is prejudgment. It's entertaining a preconceived opinion. It's treating the wisdom of the ages and past generations with some reverence. It's saying that perhaps we can't reinvent the wheel every single day. Probably we wouldn't want to if we could do that. Because maybe our forefathers weren't complete and total idiots. Maybe we're not the smartest thing that ever walked the face of the earth. Prejudice is the admission that our narrow reason perhaps cannot comprehend the immense complexity of our human nature and our experience of the world. You can't boil everything down into a little manifesto, into a little book, into a five-point plan. Prejudice is understanding that there is a weight of the tradition that perhaps it would help us to tap into. John Stuart Mill, the philosopher, explained this difference. I'll put it in my own terms, but it's his idea. That the leftist considers a received opinion, a prejudice, and he says, is it true? But the conservative considers a received opinion, a prejudice, the tradition. And he asks, what does it mean? What does it mean? Maybe there's some wisdom here. That I, Chesterton put this in another way. He talked about the fence. He has this image of the fence. You call some law or some institution. Picture it as a fence in the middle of the road. We don't know how it got there. We don't know who put it up. We don't know when it went up. The leftist reformer walks up to that fence, and he says, well, I don't see the purpose of this fence, so uh, we're going to rip it down. Now, the conservative reformer, the wise reformer, walks up, and he says, no, 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 no. If you can't tell me the purpose of this fence, if you can't tell me why this fence is here, go away. Think about why the fence is here. When you've figured out why the fence is here, come back, and perhaps then you will be allowed to tear it down. But of course, if that fence is along our southern border with Mexico, and it's big and it's beautiful, there's no way we're ever going to let them tear it down. I, this is where the metaphor breaks down. <laughs> Studies show that the right understands the left far better than the left understands the right. Uh, this has been shown out in a lot of social science, and this is one of the reasons why other surveys show that the left is far more likely to unfriend conservatives on social media, and I guess in the real media, than uh, conservatives are to unfriend the left. The reason is bigotry. The reason uh, is actually born of the defining problem of our age, which is deconstruction. And what a silly term, by the way. The word it means destruction, but the left, they make it really nice and pretty. It's as though you could destroy something and be building it up. Deconstruction. We, you know this on college campuses. We deconstruct academic disciplines. We deconstruct literature. We debunk history. We dismiss religion. We deconstruct sex. We now deconstruct sex so much that we pretend that men and women aren't different, that they don't exist. In reality, we all know that men and women are very different. But we pretend, because we've deconstructed our whole civilization, we're leveling our whole civilization. All that we know is that the present is better than the past. All that we know is that if something is happening now, it's better than something that happened a long time ago. This is the creed of progressivism. This is the creed that tells us that we are marching on the path to progress. We know what's right. Never look in the rearview mirror. There is nothing there to be gained. We are marching toward utopia. And yet, looking around, can we say that things have really improved? Our universities are falling apart. Our religious institutions are emptying. Nobody has any trust in government. We're now legalizing the killing of babies after birth. 
Is that progress? Some things have improved, obviously. The most obvious example is the treatment of black Americans in the country. Black Americans were once enslaved and excluded. Now they have legal equality. This appears to be an improvement. However, was this improvement arrived at by tearing down our prejudices? Or rather, was this arrived at by fulfilling our tradition, our prejudices? You'll remember that all the abolition movements were Christian. They were actually drawing on the most profound root of our tradition. And when we have tried to destroy the tradition, we, once, we use the tradition to get rid of the aberration of uh, exclusion and slavery. And then when we try to tear down the tradition, when we, for instance, pass radical social policies designed to materially help racial minorities, what happened? Daniel Patrick Moynihan, Bill Clinton admitted, we ended up hurting the very people that we intended to help. Not a very good idea. Edmund Burke put it very well, the godfather, the big Mac daddy of the conservative movement. He wrote, quote, Instead of casting away all of our old prejudices, we cherish them to a very considerable degree. And to take more shame to ourselves, we cherish them because they are prejudices. And the longer they have lasted, and the more generally they have prevailed, the more we cherish them. We are afraid to put men to live and trade, each on his own private stock of reason, because we suspect that this stock in each man is small, and that the individuals would do better to avail themselves of the general bank and capital of nations and of ages. Reverence for the wisdom of ages, tradition, prejudice. This requires humility. So not looking great around the world right now. Unfortunately for us, the present day left has not an ounce of humility. They have actually managed to embrace pride as their highest virtue. I don't know how they talked themselves into that. Pride is the queen of all sins, and now they hold parades to pride. Fat pride, skinny pride, gay pride, lady pride, not white pride, definitely not white pride, black pride, <laughs> all sorts of prides. The queen of all sins as the highest virtue. If the left had any modicum of uh, capacity for self-reflection, they would realize, you know, this is maybe a bad look. Maybe we should try a little humility. But they can't. They can't do it. They can't look. They are so certain that everything that came before them was wrong and rotten and stupid. They're so convinced of their own brilliance. They have on such blinders that they can't reflect on their perverse ideology. And so, for the left, the left today mistakes exclusion for tolerance, censorship for diversity, and bigotry for progress. Thank you very much. I think we're going to open it up for questions. Hi, everyone. We will now go into a Q&A section. Please line up behind the um, pink line. Maddie will help you. When it is your turn, step up to the pink X. Um, keep your questions short and in question format. I will hold the microphone for you, and yeah, we can get it started. There's a rule, by the way, at the Daily Wire, which I very much disagree with, <laughs> which is that if you disagree with me, you cut to the front of the line. I hate this rule. I think this creates terrible incentives. It incentivizes people to disagree with me, but that's the rule anyway, so if you do, be, feel free to jump up. Uh, hi, a bit of a disagreement. Um, I don't know if you know uh, Stephen Bunnell, but he talks a lot about how um, college campuses have always been, like there's always been crazy leftists and maybe now um, uh, social sciences have infiltrated HR or bad gender studies ideas are on the internet for young children, but who's to say that this won't always be around and it's not necessarily new? So uh, like, is this really that bad of a problem? You're right, your premise that the universities have always been a little kooky is true. Also, this is that bad of a problem. And the reason for it is the breakdown of even the idea of the university. Uh, Pope Benedict, in his uh, Regensburg lecture, talked about the idea of the university. Uh, John Henry Newman wrote a book called The Idea of the University. But the very essence of the university is breaking down. The idea that you have people from all of these different fields, all of these different disciplines, real academic disciplines, not just ideological activist departments, coming together and working together in a search for truth. That is a wonderful thing. And there are going to be a lot of kooks and weirdos there, but fine by me. It's been true since the Middle Ages. The trouble today 
is the tyranny of relativism. The trouble today is that you have people at institutions that ostensibly are seeking the truth who won't even admit that the truth exists in the first place. You have, particularly with the ideology of intersectionality, a basic relativism, a basic denial of the truth, except the reality of oppression, which is why all of these various disparate groups that would seem to disagree with one another all can band together to go get, get big daddy oppressor, big patriarch. Uh, this is a, a subjectivism that will hollow out and destroy the university. Uh, this has begun, you know, in, in this iteration of it about 50 years ago. Now you have what Roger Kimball calls tenured radicals, the inmates running the asylum. And it's hard to see how the liberal education, as we once knew it, could possibly survive. Today, at my dear alma mater of Yale, you can graduate with a degree in English and honors without reading Shakespeare or Chaucer. That is a profound failure of the university, and from what I can tell, it's only getting worse and worse much faster. Uh, so um, you talk a lot about, I guess, how it's always been wonky, but things are worse now than they've been. Um, where, where do you see this paradigm shift to where it is today? Looking into the future or how we got where we are? How we got where we are. Well, uh, the way we got where we are is what I just said, which is uh, the radical subjectivism. I suppose what you, I just spoke to these guys who did the grievance studies hoax. They submitted nonsense papers to academic journals and they all were peer reviewed and accepted into them. Crazy things about you know, lesbian dog parks and rewriting Mein Kampf and really wa wacky stuff to show the failure of the university. And those guys say it's, this is a, a symptom of postmodernism, which is to say it's a, a denial of the truth. Now, looking down the pike, what does that mean? I think uh, I'm neither an optimist nor a pessimist. Optimism and pessimism are two sides of the same coin. One is foolishly and eternally happy. The other is foolishly and eternally upset. I have hope. I have real hope in a certainty that things will get much, much worse before they get better. Uh, but I have a real hope because the truth will reassert itself. Reality, this is why when uh, Russell Kirk wrote The Conservative Mind, one of the early books of the modern conservative movement, it was initially called The Conservative Route. The idea that conservatism was done, these ideas were dead. And he changed it. He took a little more hope because reality reasserts itself. And frankly, it's reasserting itself right now. The fact that these speaking tours exist, the fact that student groups bring in outside speakers, the fact that there are new media cracking through the ridiculous, untrue, dishonest, uh, mainstream news media, the fact that those exist is a real sign of hope, and it's a sign that reality is breaking through. Um, so you mentioned like all of the kinds of bigotries that we see from the left. I think that one that you did mention that I feel like has become more pronounced, especially maybe in the last year, especially in the last month, is the way they've tried to make the words rich and bil billionaire into insults and like some kind of like negative quality. Do you find that this bigotry um, might catch on and be replace bigotry against white people as the primary bigotry on the left? And also, do you find it to be more dangerous than their other forms of bigotry? I don't think it's an either or situation. You know, I think the left is perfectly happy to uh, uh, turn their ire on any group unfairly. By definition, uh, very wealthy people are a small minority. I mean, this was the line of the Occupy Wall Street is, we, the 99%, need to go get the 1%. Well, I bet it'd be even easier to get them if you defined it down to the 0.5% or the 0.1%. Soak the rich is an easy idea, and this is why our founders and framers were so fearful of too much democracy, because the people one day will realize they can vote themselves more money, and then they can take the property of somebody else. But I find on the left today, it is a, a jumbled up mess of emotion. Emotivism would be what it's called. Horace Walpole, the English writer, said that life is a comedy to the man who thinks and a tragedy to the man who feels. This is why the left is so upset these days. They hate everybody. The, uh, billionaire, the billionaires and the millionaires and, you know, the straight guys and whatever. 
Uh, they're really angry and upset about all of that, but I think the rest of us find a little comedy in it. And it, it will only be the case that they can break out of that when they first, as I mentioned toward the end, when they first get a little bit of humility. You know, f fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. There is no way to argue them out of these bigotries, whether it's against billionaires or white guys or straight guys or whatever. There's no way to argue them out of it unless they first are in a position to speak, to reason, to have some humility, to have a little awe and wonder at the world, to have a little reduction in their pride. Uh, we're not going to see that yet, and I don't see them getting any less prideful. So if you have any ideas on how to humble the left, let me know. In the meantime, we'll just have to humiliate them. Hi, I'm very curious because, you know, I keep hearing Ben say this over and over and I tried Googling it and I can't find out why. Why does he call you extra bull like all the time and horrible? And <laughs> no, I, I want to know where that started I'm from. Pretty, I'm pretty sure he's saying excellent, <laughs> Michael. I'm pretty sure. I don't know. I have, I, I listen to the show and I'm pretty, I hear the excellent Michael Knowles, my good buddy whom I love. I don't, maybe, you know, I do, I'm now vaguely remembering something. Ben has written like a dozen books or something like that, uh, all of them with words in them. <laughs> Why, I couldn't possibly tell you. And so then I, it, this, the thing between us, it's a thing between best-selling authors. Uh, he and I, you know, I, I came out with my book. I sold more copies of my book than all of his books put together. Um, <laughs> So I don't know, and, and you know, the other, the other thing is that during the 2016 election, he said, I bet you that Trump won't win. And I said, well, it's not looking great right now. You know, will you give me odds? So he said, sure, I'll give you four to one odds. I said, okay, I'll take those odds. And now I have a beautiful framed check from one Ben Shapiro <laughs> sitting in my, st I mobile deposited it. I took the money, but then I framed the check. <laughs> So I don't know why he would ever call me execrable. I can't imagine. Very, very good question. I'm going to continue to think it's excellent. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to come up because I'm someone who has conservative values but is not necessarily a religious person. And I just had a slight disagreement because you did bring up the lack of people in religious institutions. I don't know if you were implying is that as a problem or something. I am. But I wanted to bring this up because you mentioned bigotry and religious bigotry is actually something that does come up. And so as someone who thinks that you are not amoral if you are, re if you are not religious, you know, I don't I, think I don't anybody's think we, amoral. Right. And so I just think coming in an opposition and, and thinking that someone who is not religious doesn't have morals is already putting you um, at a place where you're not going to be able to compromise. And so I'm wondering how you would respond to that. Well, you're arguing with a position that I don't hold. I don't think that people who are not religious are amoral or immoral or anything like that. I myself was an atheist for 10 years would have age 13 to 23, it you know, gets a little blurry around the edges, but I was an atheist for a very long time. I think it is perfectly possible to be a conservative atheist. You won't make a lot of sense, but, <laughs> but I don't think really there are a whole lot of atheists anyway. I think that naturally we are always thinking about the transcendent and the divine. And one of the reasons that atheism has taken hold is because we have a really squishy, wishy, little feelings-based culture. And so we are taught to think of God as a big teddy bear in the sky. But he's not a big teddy bear in the sky. We uh, obviously find religion and God through our reason. God gave us reason for a purpose. And we find, it through, uh, find him through revelation. Uh, this, of course, requires humility, and uh, it is certainly the case. When you just look at the effect on society, uh, participation in religious institutions, it will make you live longer, it will make you happier, it will make you uh, more content with life, it will make you feel greater purpose. You're free to do whatever you want to do, but those are all wonderful things. And you can't fake it. You also can't fake it. Uh, I'm Christian. I've come back to the faith. Not because I really want to feel comforted, 
though that's a nice plus, but because I followed the truth as far as I could, and it took me right there, time and time again, from a hundred different roads. C.S. Lewis had a line on this. He said, if you look for truth, you might find comfort in the end. But if you look for comfort, you'll find neither truth nor comfort, only soft soap and wishful thinking to begin, and in the end, despair. The decline of religiosity in our culture has a lot of negative effects. The personal effects, obviously, which we've touched on, also on society. Because either you will order yourself, either you will discipline yourself, or discipline will be imposed on you by the government or by some other institution. And it, I've never seen a society that has lost its religiosity that has, over time, been able to maintain a coherent morality, a coherent a social structure. Um, not to say that individuals can't, but then the question, of course, is why be moral if there is no lawgiver? Why be moral if the morality isn't etched in the nature of reality, if it isn't a metaphysical truth? And if it's a metaphysical truth, then who wrote that truth? Who is the arbiter of that truth? Who is that truth? And I think those are just a few of the roads that maybe could lead you, uh, lead you back to the good place. <laughs> Very good question. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, hi, Michael. Um, I've uh, studied a, a critical theory and uh, some of the philosophers from the uh, Frankf Frankfurt School. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, no, not because I wanted to learn from them, but just because I just want, wanted to, if, uh, like, track, like, the origins of these uh, uh, crazy lefty ideologies. And so what I got from them is that they, they're trying to create this, like, tension or this, like, conflict to pin different groups uh, against each other. And so, like you mentioned earlier, the the chief offender is the the straight white male who thinks that he's a he's a guy. And so, um, uh, what would what is like their end goal? So I, I've often uh, read uh, articles by lefty uh, uh, publications about uh, them celebrating that uh, uh, white people have like lower fertility uh, fertility rates and. Uh, um, uh, how they can't wait until uh, white people become a minority in this country. So even if that happens and uh, white people become a tiny minority in this country, uh, what would be their end goal with that either way? Um, wouldn't that just kind of repeat the cycle over and over again because some other group would just end up becoming the majority? And also, why do they have a special hatred for, for white people? Because they can make the argument, well, hey, they've oppressed people and, and whatnot, but like Japan oppressed a bunch of countries in Asia, and yet they don't complain about uh, they, Japan. They oppressed being, our country briefly yeah. in the 1940s, yeah. and they don't complain about Japan being like 98 percent eth ethnically Japanese and stuff. So, well, what's their end goal? It's all an attack on the tradition. That's what it's all about. I, d I mean, there are obviously we've had a whole talk tonight about the bigots predominantly on the left, and there is a enough bigotry to go around. What it all boils down to, though, is an attack on the tradition. They hate. The tradition. And so when you think of the Western tradition, it, you might have a white guy, a straight white guy who thinks that he's a guy pop into your mind. Now, I don't know, St. Augustine wasn't like the whitest guy in the world, but they kind of forget that because they have a generally paltry understanding of history and our civic institutions. That's not an insult. This is borne out by many surveys. Uh, so they use the, the white guy as a metonym for the tradition that they're attacking. But that's what it is. They hate their tradition because they hate themselves. There is a, a deep self-loathing. I hate to delve into psychobabble, but you asked, so I'll answer. There is a deep self-loathing. In you know, I guess in the case of racial politics, it comes in the form of white guilt. Or in, or in gender politics, it's the male guilt. You know, the, the f male feminists, the creepiest breed that has ever walked the face of the earth. He for she, or whatever those guys do, I don't know. Uh, it's a, it's a self-loathing, and I think it is tied down, ultimately, to religious questions. It's been said by many political thinkers, all political problems are theological problems. And so St. Andrew Breitbart, the patron saint of Hollywood conservatives, he said politics is downstream of culture. Culture, of course, is downstream of religion. It's related to the cult, what we worship. If you hate yourself, that will expand outward. You will hate your institutions of government, you will hate your culture, and you will hate God, and you have a, a really aggressive sort of atheism and uh, religious non-affiliation, not from the lovely lady who just asked a question, but from a lot of other people in this culture. And uh, ultimately, that's what it comes down to. And uh, 
this makes perfect sense as it's born out of pride, the queen of all sins. You, you see this happen throughout all of history. So just to close it off, um, and so would this just end up being like a repeating cycle? It's just like a deconstruction of like cultures just like nonstop? Or, or I've heard some conspiracies about how that's their way of creating um, a vacuum to expand the powers of the government for them to say, hey, look, there's all of these inequalities, so we need a big government to uh, straighten out these uh, or sort out all of these inequalities. Certainly it is the case that the atomization of society into the hyper-individualism that uh, people have promoted in the culture is a way to grow the government. Hyper-individualism is the fastest track to collectivism. There, Barack Obama's campaign in 2012 issued this ridiculous sort of uh, scheme. They talked about the life of Julia. Julia was there typical American, they showed from cradle to grave how Barack Obama's government would help her. And the most terrifying thing about it is the only meaningful relationship that Julia had in her whole life was with the government, a hyper-individualism that led to a collectivism. That is certainly, I mean, we're seeing that happen already. I don't think that's a conspiracy theory. The que you're asking me to predict the future. What happens after we've deconstructed everything? I hope that we stop ourselves before we deconstruct everything. I hope that we stop ourselves before we've ripped our civilization down into even more ruins that we presently have and that we can rebuild from there. But at a certain point, you can't tear down anymore. And I think you're already seeing a little pushback to that. And ultimately, the best hope I can give you is that reality will reassert itself. Hi, uh, do you live near the Los Angeles area? Yeah, I've been uh, around here for a little bit. I'm from so, New York originally, but yeah. now I live here. So I know Ben Shapiro lives in L LA too, and Dennis Prager lives in California, and I'm here too. Um, so do you think... <laughs> Are you asking me on a date? What's going on here? Uh, um, so with the online, like how YouTube is like so conservative and how we're managing to push a lot of conservative um, ideals out, do you think there's any possibility maybe not next election or in a decade, that California may start to turn light blue or purple or may even, like, you know, maybe go back to when Ronald Reagan was there. Well, you bring up a great point. California was a Republican state not too long ago. Now, I think part of the reason that so many conservatives in the media or in the culture or even in political activism, I think part of the reason they live out here is because they're so surrounded on all sides by the left. It really fires you up. It really makes you wake up ready to work every day. I think the best hope that we have is that right now, because the Democrats have so destroyed the state of California, they've made it so utterly unlivable for people who own businesses, who want to control, you know, like any aspect of their own lives. Uh, all of the lefty Californians are now fleeing to Texas where things are a lot better. So basically what we need to do, here's my plan. We empty out all of California. They can go to Texas. It's a nice big place. It's a little dusty, but it's fine. Then we take all the good conservative Texans, bring them over to California. We can all hang in the Pacific Palisades or something, and then we're all set. Uh, hello, I really enjoy your show, and I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming. Thank you very um, much. Uh, so I know you talk a lot about Ben paying you in peanuts. So I was wondering if you would uh, if you would be in favor of a living wage, specifically if it meant <laughs> that Ben would finally have to pay you mm. a proper salary. Thank you. That is such a great question, <laughs> Ben. <laughs> if you're watching, no, I have to say. I'll both defend my own economic views and talk myself out of a living wage. The reason is I have very, very expensive tastes. I like only the finest cigars, smoking jackets, really good booze. I, they, if they were to pay me a living wage, that company would not last more than one week. And then I would lose my job, and then I wouldn't get my wage anymore. So even the peanuts that I get... Even, you know, just like the sponsorships, I got, you know, I got a purple mattress the other day. That's pretty good. I'll take what I can get in my broom closet at the Daily Wire. <laughs> Hi, Michael. 
Um, so I don't disagree with you, but I wanted to run this by you as like a, an alternative. Um, why not embrace the collapse of the university and hopefully build something better from the ashes? Uh, most people in history didn't, I mean, back in the day, didn't go to college. Um, you can get, learn just about anything on the internet now or get any book. Um, I mean, and, uh, you know, I mean, why should we panic about a, a university class when it's publicly funded? Uh, you said, like you said, leftists are always entrenched in it. Um, there's degree inflation, student debt. There's fellowships like the Thiel Fellowship. I mean, let's just, why not just let it burn down? I'm with you almost. I think that I fear throwing the baby out with the bathwater. The universities have basically destroyed themselves. The left has come into the, this shell of the university and pretended like a weird zombie university that it's still providing a liberal education. Many of us, you mentioned the Teal Fellowship. I had a number of fellowships while I was in college where I learned probably more than I learned in college. I learned at those fellowships, the Hertog program, the Hudson program, the wonderful opportunities. I think those are great. Those should be encouraged. We should fund them. It's also true student loans are very high. Why are student loans very high? Because the federal government it creates all of these incentives to go to college, and it backs up the loans. So what's going to happen? The price is going to go way up. What's the other thing we're told? We're told that everybody has to go to college, which is absurd. There, is no, there are far, far too many people getting liberal arts degrees in college. Going to college, what we would call a four-year university period, far too many people. Why do I say that? I love liberal education. I assume if my kids are geared for it, that I will send them to get a liberal education. A liberal education is not intended to prepare you for a job. In fact, it is explicitly intended not to prepare you for a job. When I was in college, I studied history and Italian literature. And I would, I'd go to these things and I, I would joke and say, oh yes, it's a very useful major. But of course, liberal education is not supposed to provide useful majors, not uh, anything practical. If you want something useful, you go to law school or med school or business school or whatever afterward. Now, if you want to go, and uh, get a job right away, you should do that. If you want to go to a trade school, you should do that. If you want to enlist in the military right away, you should do that. However, the value of a liberal education is that the liberal arts are the way by which we make sense of our freedom. It's the way by which we earn our freedom. If we just go out and we're just working all the time, we are not going to be able to understand our culture and our own civilization. We will not be able to understand our own institutions. We certainly won't be able to think of how our human nature relates to our systems of government, our philosophical ideas, our religious ideas, our cultural ideas. The culture will die. We will have a totally leveled society, which, frankly, we're already on the road to. So in my ideal scheme, I'm with you. I will go. I will be an arsonist with you. I will <laughs> burn down... 97% of the metaphoric university, and I will keep that 3% remnant, and I will hide it away from leftist administrators and the deputy assistant deputy dean of equality or whatever they have. I will hide that part away, and then I would encourage everybody else to go uh, and stop wasting money at this ridiculous facade of a university and go and do something productive. Um, so, obviously, living in California, we're all surrounded by leftists all the time. Um, and I've noticed that they, they choose to assume that you just know everything about them just by looking at them. Where, especially in the trans. I mean, frankly, movement. we do. You know, when I see the purple hair, I kind of... No, that's not, that's not nice. No, but I see that as a point of pushback when you see other people who are maybe a little bit more center left or even more left than that, but not quite to that l extreme leftist point, then kind of looking at that and going, that's really strange and really weird. And I think that that could be a place where we could kind of bridge a gap between the, um, between that. So I was wondering what your, what your thought on, on the fact that they, that they, uh, you know, they make you 
of just course. say that they're... They push they're us into a corner and they want us to punch back. I, absolutely. I think you're totally right. There is a huge opportunity to bring people over from the left and from the Democrat Party. We're, we're seeing it happen all around us. There was the walk away campaign, uh, which is a real thing. You see the testimonials. You see people walking away from the left. My pal Dave Rubin is an example. He would have called himself firmly on the left. He worked for Cenk Uger, for goodness sakes. And now, he I, what is he, a classical liberal? Is center right, I guess, center left? That uh, is wonderful. How do we do that? Well, we don't pull them over by mollycoddling them. We don't bring them over by saying, oh, sweetie, no, I'll... We don't bring them over by diminishing our views or modifying our... We're not going to do that at all. We should treat them like adults. The left doesn't treat them like adults. The left doesn't behave like adults. They behave like screaming children. We should treat them like adults. And when we are speaking to them, we should always have a good sense of humor about it. This is why I strongly defend owning the libs. I think owning the libs is a wonderful thing. I think using humor in politics is a wonderful thing. You're not angry. You're not vicious. You're not mean or cruel. You're confident. You say what you think. You ask them what they think. You're patient that they haven't thought about what you've thought of yet. And you bring them over. I think we're already doing it. I think it's working. Yep. Thanks for coming. Uh, I have one question and one comment. So my question is, in terms of that G.K. Chesterton quote, what are some of those fences that we really need to retain that are being plucked down. So like, what values do you think are most important? And are there any American values that are being picked at and perhaps rightfully so? We want to leave them behind. And uh, the comment is, as a Bay Area resident, I just feel responsible to let you know it's Stephen Curry, not Stephen Curry. Oh, so Stephen. Stephen oh. Curry. So your future talks. I, Stephen. Know, it just caught me, caught well, me off he's guard. The, yeah. He's the ball player? He's the he's sportsman? He's the ball player. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Three, three, okay, <laughs> the white supremacist. I Googled yeah. him. I said, hold on a sec. I, I, I at least got his sign, though, right. His, his sign, sign he is right. still a bigot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, it's just and his name is different. Yeah, okay. exactly. It's uh, <laughs> a good point. I'll put that in my notes. Um, as far as the fences go, I think uh, the, the most pertinent one to all of us here is free expression, freedom of thought, academic thought. We, this is a, a pillar of the West. We have always had a wonderfully free expression. The university is the outgrowth of that free expression, the ability to use our right reason to discuss reality with one another. And it's being ripped apart. It's being ripped apart right here. I mean, I'm very pleased that I got to come speak tonight. Sometimes I'm not allowed to go to universities. Sometimes Ben Shapiro gets invited to a university, then he gets disinvited from a university. Uh, that's bizarre, and that, that is, uh, I would understand if it were just the students, because students are ignorant. That's the definition of a student. I would almost understand if it were the faculty, not really, a little less so, but the faculty, are, uh, they can be a little kooky too. But it's all three, it's the administration and the faculty and the students. Nobody is defending free expression, free thought academic discourse. Nobody is defending that anymore. That is a fence that they are already clawing down. It is barely there anymore, and we need to, you know, build it up 10 feet higher and get Mexico to pay for it or something. That's probably the most important one right now, though there are many others. Good question. So that is the end of our Q&A session. Michael, if you have any closing remarks, please go ahead. Well, I had a soliloquy to recite to you all, but no, you know, it's late. Uh, no, I don't have any closing remarks. The one thing I will say, if we get to see each other afterward or uh, take photos or anything, I believe I have the bubonic plague right now. You can probably hear it in my voice. So I will not shake your hand. This is not an example of bigotry, I promise you. This is not an example of some animus. Uh, but uh, in any case, thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure to talk to you all.